I cannot commence the writing on the otherness, the monstrous, the body and skin as the phenomenon of bodily otherness. All I can do is write beside, graft to the existing aggregates of knowledge, in Hegel's words, of normative scientific production. In other words, Hegel begins his phenomenology of spirit with famous introduction in which he investigates the sole function of the preface as such. At the beginning, Hegel determines the form of introduction as excessive, inappropriate and out of place. The introduction was written several months after the book itself. The question Hegel sets in front of us is crucial. Is it possible to write an introduction to any philosophical text? Can we write about a philosophical text after the text has been written in a different language and within a different order, that is, the order that isn't philosophical anymore? Can one write on philosophy in a non-philosophical way? On the other side, how can one write an introduction to uh, some text whose dialectics of becoming is so complex that any analytical prologue would be stagnant and wouldn't be able to show the processes and ways of dealing with the concepts and drawing conclusions as if they exist independently from the particular work on the conceptualization and deduction. Hegel's foreword is indeed an afterword, one of the most remarkable in the history of philosophy. As if Hegel, from the other side of his philosophical system, is initiating us into the secret of the introduction, into some additional contradictory effects of the prelude to the text of philosophy. Can we think of the epilogue as a certain determined, delayed politics of the textual, in which the text itself is to be silenced and its, its potentialities elaborated and strictly controlled? I will argue that the forward or afterward exists in order to legitimize and enable the scientific textuality, its methods, or the hazardous intermix of methods, its ends, contributions, and uncanny end place. In relation to the epistemological and political aggregation on the horizon of knowledge within which the monstrous other resides, as a fixed and formed figure, writing on the otherness would mean that one has to do the demanding work of paleonymy, to dig out and preserve corpuses of words entombed in ancient, in ancient and contemporary structures of knowledge and in political structures as well. In his book, uh, Dissemination, Derrida, in his extra text, is dealing with the future past, recognizing the uncanny temporality of introduction. As Hegel did before him, Derrida asks the same dangerous question. Does the foreword exist? Isn't it the case that every introduction is at the same time inside and outside in relation to the content in it represents? Isn't every prologue at the same time before and after the text? Isn't it bifacial and hybrid? If we state that the introduction is futile, unavoidable, but impossible at the same time, we are immediately faced with the conclusion that the very, fo very form of forward reveals the erosion in the monolithic content structure, a crack in the grandiose giant body of philosophical text. Who needs an introduction after all? Who needs this book or any book at all? Complex mutuality and competitions between the text and the before and after the text surely draw our attention to the necessity of scientific and ideological disciplinary and discursive positioning that intends to obtain the legitimacy for this complex relationship. Hence, with all the conceptual predicaments of a forward that is always already an afterward, and with the hopefully productive illusion that I can perform double reading and double writing, that lies at the heart of the construction, this book intends to occupy a generic place of an epilogue, a postscriptum. With that in mind, with this postscriptum, I won't be establishing and producing new knowledge or new aggregates. 
To the contrary, my intention is to rewrite, unwrite, describe, and raise, erase, and dig in. I will try to show that the phenomenon of the otherness eludes linguistic formulations, but that the monster, skin, and body obtain and temporalize marks. Hence, their otherness cannot be a mere object of, of analysis without setting limits to the analysis itself. Monsters, bodies, and skins indicate the diverseness and the political questionability of the production of limits and the politics of ex exclusion. The word scriptum preserved its ties to Proto-Indo-European root scrib, meaning to cut, to separate. Writing plays a part in cutting, through, off, in, in various forms of division and splitting, to write by cutting, by splitting, as a patchwork, within which every plane, every piece, stands aside to the grafted totality. Furthermore, the notion of separation and cutting are the basic attributes and or risks of the skin. This text is always written, it was written, as a text of knowledge, text on skin, or a skin as a text to be read through and out. But outside of that text, and always outside or aside that text, the, that text, the skin is a postscriptum that becomes after and beyond. In the same manner, the afterword to that text on skin, or text as such, is a foreword, that which announces itself as a written text, inasmuch a text, or what is left of the text, hence postscriptum. The so-called chapters of this book offer different readings, different approaches and retreats from the body of knowledge on politics of space, on skin, body and the monstrous. My aim is to indicate the complexity of skin and its indefinite speciality as well as the immensurability of skin's extensions, the most multiplicity of skin. The proposed sites of division and separation are actually knots lesions, networks, and foldings, the sites of intensity and dodging, that always require different entrances and exits, always another threshold, another kind of sensorium, different eyes, different ears, different skin, language, and with it all different touching. This postscriptum, devoid of any visible scriptum, represents a spe special economy of writing on monstrous otherness, on body and skin, that economy takes uh, into account the knowledge on of the other and or monstrous, the excessive burden of Western thought, and the knowledge on the skin as a momentous signifier of the body taken as the other. It will take into consideration the scenes and rhetorics of that knowledge. Or accordingly, this postscriptum does not stand outside those aggregates of knowledge, nor within them, but is a collapse, a falling down the abyss, into the groundlessness of every knowledge, the opening, the opening of the bottomless depths of knowledge production. Between the one same and the other, the third, that is the skin, emerges. The skin touches upon both of these limits between inside and outside and not only in between but becoming in between as such, overflowing on both sides over and beyond the limits. This part uh, represents the secondary postscriptum residing on the regulative boundaries of the text as a whole and will gradually expose its nakedness peel away the fashion theory accessories and genre envelopes, indicating the obscurity of the kilted dermatology of any theory. The politics of the monstrous tends to reveal with a subtle tactility that under the genre jewelry of mainstream theory there isn't some body of positivi positivist knowledge and determinable content, but that the only knowledge we can count on is the undoing of the knowledge, the unlearning process exposing and ludically destabilizing the generative, epistemological and political imaginarium. This unlearning always comes after the writing as a perilous supplement, as a postscriptum. The result of undoing the epistemic and political knowledge is precisely the fragmentary composition of this text. 
in vicinity to Frankensteinian's stitched skin, stolen from cadavers, and its corpse-like iconodermia, this book is tracing the sites of grafts, scars, and stitches on the worn-out body of knowledge production. The fragmentary journey of this book in is embedded in the poetics of interruptions, cuts, and stitches, and that would be the poetics of postscriptum. Production of interruptions introduces a special form of presence and appearance when the disappearance reappears, as Bard has already shown. Thinking the monster outside the ontology of being is itself a monstrous endeavor, following Bard's question, who endures contradiction without shame, and probing monstrous tendencies to read and derite the monster with all the logical and political contradictions that this kind of thinking can produce, I will ask the following questions. Who can endure the monster of thinking without fear and trembling? And what spaces are menacing enough to leave us without language and logic, logical miniatures of identity and contra contradiction? The monstrous is a form of knowledge that is always already unthinkable. It is a discursive monster. In, in the words of one unthinkable writer monster, that is Derrida. And this book will expose itself as a certain kind of intimate academic writing. How can one write on monster any other way than from the most intimate cracks of identity structures? In order to justify the politics of the monstrous as a new field of research, I would strive to differentiate the self as a monster, to hunt the, with the normative logical fish hook of irony, and fearful specters, the monstrous caesuras of poetics and politics of the monstrous. I will initiate the reinvestigation of the anatomy of gender and the culture of sex. And we can also play with Sixus' notion of spiritual anatomist while reinvestigating the dichotomy of culture anatomy. Uh, I will initiate the reinvestigation of this an anatomy and the skin racial chromatism. Beside that, I will uh, dive into the minor geophilosophy and the politics of cartography. Those theoretical paths cannot be positivist vivisections of the body, of the eye monster, nor the anatomical intersection of the concept of the monster. To deconstruct a concept, any concept, is to actually become a parasite on the textual, symbolical, political. It, me it means to be a paraontologist, the one who will not and cannot state what is the essence of the concept of the monster, the one that cannot and does not want to offer its translation or all the possible translations, the one that always takes into account the reminders on the margin, that which stands aside or on the text, which tickles the delicate body of prescribed essence. And to insist on the fixed essence, on the mere unchangeable heart of the phenomenon under the word, would end up leaving us without any critical questions. So the question of the monstrous. This question, it seems, already offers an answer contained uh, and contains it within itself. But the monster of the question introduces the dangerous excess. Haven't we transcended the ambiguous answers? Or better yet, aren't we beyond any possible and thinkable answer? So, what is the monster? Who is the monster? What are the features of the monster? How do I recognize a monster? Can I become a monster? Am I a monster? Is my neighbor a monster? Does monster exist? Who is the monster of the monster? Is monster human? Is monster humane? Is a man a monster? Is monster a part of nature? Is the nature monstrous? Is monster an idea? Is an idea a monster? Is monster a part of the world? Where is the monster? When is the monster? Does monster speak in my language? Is monster literate? What is the ethics of a monster? And these questions are perilous uh, because they rest on the illusion of binarisms, on an imperative to offer clear and distinct answers placed between the dichotomies of yes and no. Monsters need to be recognized within the processes of political subjectivation and humanization. Jeffrey Jerome Cohen, in his Monster Theory Reading Culture, introduced the aphorism as an answer to the question of whether monsters exist. And he states that they exist 
in as much as I exist, in as much as the man exists. The concept of the man is impossible without the monster. Without the monster, the man is terrifying. In the absence of the situated, excluded, identified and objectified monster, the man is politically impossible. Tracing the complex connections between the machine and the monster in the age of scientific discoveries, Zaki Hanafi asserts that the monstrous could be approached not from the perspective of psychological manifestation of fear, but as understanding the figure of the monster as an ideological cluster, as a place of exclusive constituting the monstrous inside and outside across a wider social environment. Politics of the monstrous have their eminent precursors, the ones who maintained and constructed the alterity of the monster and made the community of the same and possible sustainable, or the ones who paved the way for critical interrogation of the monstrous other. For example, the scapegoat by René Girard, foreigner by Sigmund Bauman, Levinas' notion of the other, Agamben's concept of bare life, Foucault's genealogy of the abnormal, Gramsci's political monster, etc. And it is a never-ending list. Firstly, it is necessary to elaborate on the crucial work of Carl Schmitt and his notion of the enemy, which is directly re related to the notion of the sovereign and the political, as stated in his seminal text, the concept of the political, Der Begriff des Politischen from 1932. Schmidt introduced the figure of an enemy in order to establish the criteria for the concept of the political, for a specificity of the political based on the logics of presupposed enmity towards that which is non-same. The concept of the political understood in, in this way is actually dismantled on the level of humanity that is regarding the final realization of the completely pacified globe on the grounds that the world peace is the ultimate political enemy. Consequently, determination of polit politics depends on constituting the political enemy, but the ultimate enemy of politics would be precisely the absence of the enemy as such, inasmuch as the distinction between a friend and an enemy is grounded on the real possibility of war. Open quote. A world in which the possibility of war is utterly eliminated, a completely pacified globe, would be a world without the distinction of friend and enemy, and hence a world without politics." End of quote. The enemy is always a public one, not a private foe. But the politics of the monstrous I'm proposing could surely further problematize this Schmidt's argument. Open quote. The enemy is solely the public enemy because everything that has a relationship to such a community of men, particularly to a whole nation, becomes public by virtue of such a relation, relationship. The enemy is hostis, not inimicus, in the broader sense. So, if the only political enemy is the public enemy, then precisely the pub pub publicity of enemy production and placing or localizing the enemy crosses over the axis of public-private distinction. Public enemy thus becomes and must become a private enemy, not our enemy, a collective one, but mine or yours. The public enemy is an affective figuration able to internalize the political enemy and brings him or her into the everyday practices of those friends of ipsaity, those who base their friendship solely on belonging to pre-established constituted sameness. The public enemy is the most private, perhaps even the most intimate enemy. In effect, every time we ask ourselves on who the personal enemy truly is, the answer will refer to the political place as such. That is, we will come to a realization that the enemy is always already coded and delivered as a ready-made commodity and that we only need to modify publicly constructed enemy to attribute to the enemy certain personal features and to initiate him or her into the intimate battle on the grounds of rights, rights and identities. The enemy is always already personal. In other words, the enemy is indeed the exclusive center of the friend itself, 
the most unfriendly is the friendliest, it is the common and the proper that is settled on the mandatory sameness. In the politics of friendship from 1994, Jacques Derrida has already recognized the enemy as a neighbor, the familiar one, one's fellow man. Open quote. The figure, of, the figure of the enemy would then be helpful precisely as a figure because of the features which allow it to be identified as such still identical to what has always been determined under, the, under, the, under this name. An identifiable enemy, that is, one who is reliable to the point of treachery and thereby familiar, one's fellow man in some who could almost be loved as oneself, he is acknowledged and recognized against the backdrop of a common history. This adversary would remain a neighbor even if he were an evil neighbor against whom war would have to be waged." End quote. In pursuing this paradoxical political logic that sets as a primary criteria the recognition of the political enemy, the enemy is indeed the place according to which the political I, self, and the political we is constituted as a friend. In other words, in Schmidt's work, the case that the subjectivity is always and again affirmed in indefinite production of the enemy is the subject of deconstructive critique that reveals in Schmittian assertion unreflective, unreflected deposits of metaphysics, as Ivan Milenkovic states in his doctoral thesis. And to conclude this first part, the politics of the monstrous intends to re-question and rethink the constitution, forming, maintaining, and reproducing the idea of normative, normalized, human, and the politically recognized included unaccounted for that imposes itself as an inevitable starting point to think the figures of the monstrous others. The second part of this second chapter, titled Why the Politics of the Monstrous, deals with uh, some monstrous uh, deconstructive embrace between Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's uh, insights into the monster, theory of the monster, and uh, Jacques Rancière's uh, notion of the political. So let's proceed. Even though Jeffrey Jerome Cohen has the De determined the monstrous body as pure culture, and Judith Butler offered an insight that the construction of the human is a differential operation that produces the more and the less human, the inhuman, the humanly unthinkable, I would like to suggest another possibility of understanding the monstrous, and let's accept for a start that the monster is the inhumane or hum humanly unthinkable. So I would like to suggest uh, the understanding of the monstrous, monstrous as the pure political, that is, the body which is localized on the shores of the political. According to Jacques Rancière, the shores of the political are here represented as a displacement of the question of beginnings and ends of politics according to its frontiers, different ways of delimiting its territory, setting its limits and encounters with its abysses. The syntagm, pure political, is the displaced equivalent to Cohen's concept of pure culture. I want to make clear and to avoid any misunderstanding that might come up regarding the controversial notion of the pure. Therefore, I must insist that the accent isn't placed on the pure as such, but rather on the second word, political or culture. The pure, in these words, is not to be understood as contaminated and unviolated space, identity or subjectivation, but as a way to disrupt the figure of the monster within the medical, biological, cartographical, media and teratological determinations. If the monstrous or the body of monster is the pure culture or the pure political, it is such only as an instance of critical rethinking of apologetic discourses that claim that the culture and politics have no part in production of the monstrous other, even though they are the birthplace of violence and in naming, signifying and hegemonic grand narratives. Culture and politics have built the magnificent, 
memorial to human, as a master humanist value, creating along the way dangerous and seductive cultural and political narratives on the humanly unthinkable, thus making it possible to think the human at all. Accordingly, pure culture and pure political, while completely different qualifications, surely don't accentuate anything pure, but are persistently including, introducing and calling for the impure in order to reveal the violence at the core of the pure. On these sides of differentiations and amid the slippery and uncomfortable encounters with its fissures, the politics of the monstrous has to confront the passionate practices of the exclusive one and the same. Those passions are, as Rancière points out, more primitive and destructive than the turmoil of the multitude. As opposed to the politics of the power struggle, the political emerges as a question of communal life, as a question of community. Rancière's determination of the political as a confrontation between two principles, polis and politics, that is the system of forms within which they are closely tied together, can be a good starting point to give a voice to passions of the multitudes that are always marked as threatening, terrifying, monstrous and ungovernable. What politics are we talking about if not the politics of the monstrous, foreign, other and multiple? It can create a solid groundless ground for a certain concern for the other that is not ethical but truly political. Uh, just like Foucault is interrogating the notion of the care of the of the care of the self that includes ethical questions of the care of the other, Rancière is rethinking the concern of the other, but from a strict, strictly political perspective. Ultimately, uh, to dwell on the shores of politics would mean to apprehend the absence, absences from the political field of those who are not returning to a particular particularity that has been denied, unmarginalized and minor identities and political non-political subjects who also reconquer and invent new humanity or new forms of non-humanity, new political positionings, political subjects that are disruptive, unlocalized, who reside on the conceptual, cultural, epistemological, institutional, corporeal and teratological shores of politics as those unaccounted for. In the realm of political ontology, the monster cannot be reduced to the one and the same. If we cannot speak on the monstrous pr from the perspective of ontotheological thinking, perhaps we can approach it vigilantly from the realm of etymology. There is always a certain risk of many possible errant, insufficient and neurologic translations. Hence, the etymology can offer us a vertigo of word play, unlike the worn-out logic of classes and categories. The word monster can enable more challenging and provocative encounters with political ontology. The word monster has Latin origin and the associations it brings into the language play are quite disturbing and exciting. On the one side, the verb monstrare indicates the meaning of showing, revealing and demonstrating. On the other hand, the verb monere indicates the warning, omen and prediction. Used as a noun, the word is associated with the rich and genealogically immersive meaning of revelation. Monster is tightly related to old Greek word teratos, meaning wonder, marvel, sign and surreal. The term itself implies the possibility of double reading of the monster and to the double treatment of the monster. So the monster designates the sacral and the profane, the fascinating and the terrifying, salvation and damnation. In the same manner, the etymology points to the figures at the limit, always in between or on the shores of political. The ontological status of the monster figure is liminal, unidentifiable, incomplete and fragmentary. The monster isn't a politically existent entity, even though it was always attributed with political meanings and values. From the perspective of the politics of the monstrous, 
the monster is becoming political and therefore it is not reducible to the ontological being or non-being. With that in mind, the monster is invisible, unrepresentable, but always already exposed body, made visible solely for the purpose of maintaining non-monstrous or monstrous human, identically closed and vulnerable political regime of absaity. As Rancière puts it, open quote, there is politics as long as the people is not identified with the race or population, inasmuch as the poor are not equated with a particular disadvantaged sector, and as long as the proletariat is not a group of industrial workers, etc. Rather, there is political inasmuch as the people refers to the subjects inscribed as a supplement to the count of the parts of society, a specific figure of the part of those who have no part. Nancy states this in a Ten Thesis on Politics. The politics of the monsters, populated by theoretical hordes of monsters, banished and expatriated by the classical political thinking, deprived of their part, is a distressing practice of those absent from the political field. These hordes of monsters, of the unaccounted for, signal the serious, dangerous and agonizing proximity between the politics of monsterization and the politics of humanization of, or subjectivation. They reveal almost unthinkable monstrous body curtailed by a discursive human skin. Rancière states that the people is an abstract supplement in relation to any actual account of the parts of the population. The supplement that inscribes the count of the unaccounted for, or the part of those who have no part. Tracing that path of thinking, we might say that the monster is a supplement, the count of the unaccounted for, but only in a way that the unaccounted part is actually without a part, always a part of having no part outside the political, within which the monster has no part at all. The title of the third chapter of the book, The Politics of the Monstrous Postscriptum, is Hugh Manuel, The Scene of Writing, and I will try to divide it in two parts. Uh, let me begin. It may seem unrelated to the politics of the monstrous, but this chapter might be the strongest disturbance within the politics of thinking on the category of the human. The unrelatedness concerns apparently non-political realms of poetical and philosophical treatments of the notion of human, and the proclamation of thinking as a distincting quality of the human. My aim is to set the scene for a provocative and temporarily remote dialogue between one poet, Friedrich Hölderlin, and one philosopher, Martin Heidegger as a momentous encounter in the history of Western thinking on humanism and the notion of the man. Hölderlin and Heidegger have placed the man in intense and thought-provoking vicinity to the concept of the monster. Both of them are exquisitely distanced from the epistemological imaginarium of setting boundaries between man and monster, and they cut across the human-monster dichotomy using a subtle instrument of reimagining the relation of signification and techniques. The opening lines of Friedrich Hölderlin's hymn Mnemosyn concern the final closure of the human in meaninglessness and the loss of speech. Open quote, we are assigned meaningless, we are painless and have almost forgotten speech in exile. In German, the verses are the following. Ein Zeichen sind wir, deutungslos, schmerzlos sind wir, und haben fast die Sprache in der Fremde verloren. End of quote. Etymology of the word monster is associated to the term sign. Monsters signify, reveal, and demonstrate as signs of the future to come, surreal and apocalyptic. Hölderlin's verses open the space for the touching and detouching of the words we, sign, and monster touching, perhaps too much, takes place within the line we are a sign, ein Zeichen sind wir, as a pseudo-ontological assertion. But on the other side, touching is too remote and painless with the supplementation, with determination, 
determination of the sign as devoid of meaning, as meaningless, Deutungslos. In what is called thinking, was heißt Denken, Martin Heidegger was struggling with these verses and Hölderlin's poetry will remain a recurrent curved quotation practice in Heidegger's rethinking of the thinking itself. At the heart of Heidegger's poetic philosophy, if one can, if one can say so, is a demanding conversation with a poet whose assertions, as none other, are tracing their own echo in thinking itself. Hölderlin's verses would become the site of Heidegger's re-questioning the unthinkable, or to be more precise, of stating that what is the most thought-provoking is that we are still not thinking. From the outset of Heidegger's question on what is the element in which thought operates, and his insight that what must be thought about turns away from man, I intend to translate the position of sign, das Zeichen, into the prosperous signification of the monster, whose meaning the man is deprived from, and what is always already withdrawn from us. Open quote. What withdraws from us draws us along by its very withdrawal, whether or not we become aware of it immediately or at all. Once we are drawn into the withdrawal, we are drawing towards what draws, attracts us by its withdrawal, and once we, being so attracted, are drawing toward what draws us, our essential nature already bears the stamp of drawing toward. This uncanny dramatic chronotop in which poetry and thinking are mutually engaged will become an unavoidable aporia in additional dramatic acts. These delayed and supplemented acts are rewritten by Jacques Derrida, the most acute thinker of the monster text. Topography and topoetics of these encounters of poetical and philosophical notions of thinking the unthinkable is this topic. It is taking place on the scene of unending play of differences. The time is forking into paramount parabases, into counter temporal, non linear resistances, and we are faced with the radical distancing, with standing aside, aparte. In a lecture, Geschlecht, second part, Heidegger's Hand, from 1987, Derrida approaches the notion of the monster by following the traces of the handiwork left by Heidegger in what is called thinking. The separating line between the idea of a man, animal and monster, with the scope of Heidegger's thinking on what is called thinking is precisely the phenomenon of the hand. At the same time, the notion of hand is what determines the man as such. The hand is necessarily human, monstrous, demonstrative, pointing and signifying, and necessarily one, singular. Derrida points to the fact that Heidegger uses the word hand only in singular as a very singular thing that would rightfully belong only to man, and continues in this disruptive trajectory as follows. He always thinks the hand in the singular, as if man did not have two hands, but this monster one single hand. Or, in Heidegger's account of the man as a sign, as a monster, we can state that when man is drawing into what withdraws, he points into what withdraws. As we are drawing that way, we are a sign, a pointer. But we are pointing then to add something, which has not, not yet, been transposed into the language of our speech. We are a sign that is not read. So, the man points to that which withdraws. The man is a sign pointing to a sign that is not and cannot be read. Derrida is examining the relation of the hand to the word and the thinking. And furthermore, uh, he is thinking the opposition between the hand of the man or, and every other Geschlecht, as he states, and above all the hands of the ape. The hands, plural, now plural, in plural, indicate the play in the theater of hands, that is the organic or technical dissipation. According to Heidegger, the ape does not have a hand, but prehensile organs that resemble hands, therefore hands. In that respect, Derrida asks, Open quote, isn't he, the man, a monster with a single hand, end quote. The man, his name, his Geschlecht, 
names what has the hand and so thinking speech or language and openness to the gift or openness to death, I might add. Hence, in this text, Derrida will bring Heidegger's hands and the plural is intentional and true to Derrida's text. So Derrida will bring Heidegger's hands to the stage of monstrous thinking of the difference into the, the economy of difference. The stage is set forth the hand to call in a double bind to show or to point to a sign and to give and to be a gift. The hand is calling and pointing, pointing monstrous as it is and the man being a sign is a monster. A hand in the middle of the body makes the human body a monstrous one. The man in Heidegger's elaboration is a monster in a very special form. The only possible monster is the man as a species, Geschlecht, that is capable to, th to think and speak as a monstrating handiwork, handwerk. Open quote, man's hand will then be a thing apart, not as a separable organ, but it is different, dissimilar, verschieden, from all prehensile organs, pose, claws, talons, man's hand is far from these in an infinite way, unendlich, through the abyss of its being, durch einen Abgrund des Wesens. This abyss is speech and thought. Only a being who can speak, that is, think, can have the hand and can be handy, in der Handhabung, in achieving these works of handicraft. Man's hand is taught ever since thought, but thought is taught ever since speaking or language. That is the order Heidegger opposes to metaphysics. Only when man speaks does he think, not the other way around as metaphysics still believes. End of quote. I have omitted the parts in German. So Derrida ardently defies the demand to translate the German word Geschlecht and constantly underlines the predicament of such an endeavor in translating this sen sensible, critical and sensitive word Geschlecht. When we start translating this word, this concept of Geschlecht, we are always dealing with norms and forms, with species and genus, family, generation or genealogy community. And at this place, the spacing of the of this neurologic and critical word, word the monster is insist insistently placed at the shores of normative, normalized, on the form and, and deviant, outside of the species and outside of genus of man. Derrida confronts Hildelin and Heidegger in one uncanny way, indicating that Hildelin's we, that sign, devoid of meaning, is in Heidegger's interpretation becoming an assemble, a gathering together, that is a monster that shows nothing. Derrida sets in front of us a perilous question that already disarranges the famous dramatic mise-en-scene. If the we is the stake of the hand that points, shows, indicates toward the sign of thinking that withdraws, isn't that we precisely a monstrosity of monstration? Open quote. This gap of the sign to itself and to its so-called normal function, isn't it, isn't it already a monstros monstrosity of monstrosity, a monstrosity of monstration? And that is we, we inasmuch as we have nearly lost our tongue in foreign lands, perhaps in a translation. But this we, the monster, is, is it a man? End of quote. Hence, does this we, from Hölderlin's hymn, mean we the people? Heidegger seems to, th to think so, and he associates the question of man to the question of the difference in hand, to thinking, but also to the hand in thinking. Thinking is of the body, it is a handiwork, human manual labor, but in a deconstructive reading, the question is the one of the shifting difference between the instrumentalist concepts of hands, concept of hands, prehensile organs and in plural, and the hand as a call to give and to be given. Heidegger does not understand the hand as an instrument. The hand is not a part of organic world, but a quite separate thing. If the hand is to be taken as an organ of prehension, then it is a part of organic biological program of animality and not human. In Heidegger's accounts, hands are displaced twice towards the organic biological animal and toward the destruction of gathering together, versammlung, of techniques. In, in, in the first case, 
We are dealing with the constitution of the humanity of the human, within the hand that is open to give and receive, not within hands as organs of grasping. In the second case, Heidegger observes a work of hands on a typewriter as an uncanny scene of writing, a typographic mechanization that destroys the unity of the world, this integral identity, this proper integrity of the sp spoken word, that writing manuscripts at once because it appears closer to the voice or body proper and because it ties together the letters, conserves and gathers together." End quote. So what are all the possible ways to rethink these two exteriorities of human Geschlecht, animal and machine? In what way uh, do the animalization of hands and the technologization of hands concern the inconceivable possibilities of the monster text or the monster writing? Derrida was devoted to the gay science of monster writing. The idea of a new text, open and unapproachable, the monster text, can be traced in his various works. But the last sentence in a text that produced an earthquake in the hegemony of structuralist thinking, namely the text Structure, Sign and Play in the Discourse of Human Sciences, announces one such monster text. That is, it proclaims monstrous births from which even the author himself is turning his eyes away. Open quote. Here is a kind of question, let us still call it historical, whose conception, formation, gestation and labor we are only catching a glimpse of today. I employ these words, I admit, with a glance toward the operations of childbearing, but also with a glance toward those who, in a society from which I do not exclude myself, turn their eyes away when faced by the as yet unnameable which is proclaiming itself and which can do so as is nece necessary when a bird is in the offing only under the species of the non-species in the formless, mute, infant and terrifying form of monstrosity." End of quote. Given that in every bird and every childbearing phases we can witness the agency of the monstrous unnameable the species of the non-species, Derrida is turning his eyes toward this turning eyes away uh, from that yet unnameable represents an, and this represents an important and disrupt disruptive event in thinking. If writing is inaugural, Derrida intends to show, it is not so because it creates but because of a certain absolute freedom of speech, because of the freedom of, to bring forth the already there as a sign of the freedom to augur. Isn't this the specification of the monster par excellence, Deridian as such, even since the grammatological investigations? In an interview, Jacques Derrida, Deconstruction and the Other, from 1984, Derrida points to the monster text, open quote, the text produces a language of its own, in itself, which while continuing to work through translation, emerges at a given moment as a monster, a monstrous mutation without tradition or normative precedent. End of quote. After the question on the relation between the monster of his writing and the recollection of the absence of power, Derrida states that, open quote, if there were monsters there, the fact that this writing is prey to monsters or to its own monsters would indicate, by the same token, powerlessness. One of the meanings of the monsters, monstrous is that it leaves us without power, uh, that it is precisely too powerful or, in any case, too threatening uh, for the powers to be. Notice, I say, if there were monsters in this writing. But the notion of the monster is rather difficult to deal with, to get a hold on, to stabilize. A monster may be obviously a composite figure of heterogeneous organisms that are grafted onto each other. This graft, this hybridization, this composition that puts heterogeneous bodies together may be called a monster." End of quote. Tracing this production of resistances to which the monster text summons us, I will treat the question 
of otherness as related to the figure of a monster as radically other. The figure of the monster will serve as an intimate experience of, experience of otherness and as a devaluating the one within the economy of ipsaity. It will be necessary for these monster figures to populate or to inhabit the spaces of otherness, geopolitical, biopolitical, necropolitical, mythopolitical, only to be multiplied as a body of excess or bodies of excesses that the economy of the same, that economy of ipsaity, cannot capitalize, apprehend or produce, but that is precisely created by this powerlessness. It is of great importance to quote to Derrida once again, open quote. This in fact happens in certain kind of writing. At the moment, monstrosity may reveal or make one aware of what normality is. Faced with a monster, one may become aware of what the norm is and when this norm has a history, which is the case with discursive norms, political norms, philosophical norms, so socio social cultural norms. They have a history. Any appearance of monstrosity in this domain allows an analysis of the history of the norms. But to do that, one must conduct not only a theoretical analysis, one must produce what in fact looks like a discursive monster so that, so that the analysis will be a practical effect, so that people will be forced to become aware of the history of normality. But a monster is not just that. It is not just this chimerical figure in some way that grafts one animal onto another, one living being onto another." End quote. Body excess is permanently dismembered and again remembered in dermal skin extensions of the body text, from Frankenstein to the stitches of Patchwork Girl, from linear to hypertext, from racial skin chromatism to taxidermy and to nanotechnology. Open quote, a monster is always alive, let us not forget. Monsters are living, living beings. The monster is also that which appears from the first time and consequently is not yet recognized, end quote. To give and take, to be given as a gift and to receive a gift is the ultimate experience of the other, the monster, an impossible gift, maybe pure gift, even the absolute hospitality the welcoming of the intruder, the monster, the not yet species. Derrida is investigating this potential of human hand, of a handshake and of praying hands to be open to receive a gift, as a monstrosity of the gift or of that which is giving itself. The dichotomy of giving and taking or of the gift that is present and the present that takes will become an obsessive thought in Derrida's aporetic trajectories on hospitality, the foreigner, gift, and present. Open quote. For instance, the statement according to which the only possible gift is an impossible gift is meaningful. Where I can give only what I am able to give, what I, what I am able to give, what it is possible for me to give, I don't give. So for me to give something, I have to give something I don't have, that is, to make an impossible gift." End of quote. Derrida's logic, as he himself name, names it like that, or the logically irrefutable, will be an interesting starting point to reading the monster and to set the problem of alterity. Isn't Derrida's repetitive question at the beginning of his psyche, Inventions of the Other, from 1983, alluring? Open quote. What else am I going to be able to invent?" End of quote. Within the economy of the same, all I can invent is the possible. To invent, to invent the impossible would mean that an invention always presupposes some illegality, the breaking of an implicit contract, it inserts a disorder into the peaceful ordering of things, it disregards the pro proprieties. End of quote. And to invent or even uh, or ever be able to invent something else is to face the experience of the other as the invention of the impossible, in other words, as the only possible invention. The invention of the impossible presumes that an invention has to announce itself as an invention of that which does not come to us as a possibility at all. 
to invent the other after a long time, so long that no calendar in history can give its measure, after the timeless trace that Hölderlin has left for us, would not implicate that we should reconquer the meaning we are deprived of, but rather to think what we are not yet thinking, or what we cannot think solely by inhabiting the thinking as such. The other cannot be epistemologically conquered, nor uh, can the other be inhabited. Hands show us that. Phantom hands that are, that are writing these lines. The hands that twist their wrists and pervert the imprint of this academic writing. The hands will play a significant part in this intimate conversation with the monsters. Heidegger's hands, Kafka's, Derrida's, Nietzsche's, Nancy's, mine, yours, human, animal, demonstrating, pointing hands, humanual, and monstrous. So, do not expect to enter this text without leaving something behind, without a loss. Monsters just seem to be under the pervane of recognizability, and they are not easily tracked and hunted down. You won't enter their homelessness as conquerors, conquerors besieging imaginary fortresses. Monsters are, are not necessarily a community of evil warriors. They are fortified, but by a conceptual columbarium of epistemological and political violence. Monsters are hospitable because they are dispossessed, but they demand the hospitality of their guests. May this academic incision be a contingent notebook, a comparative interpretation of memory scape whose only references can be found in literary and philosophical archives. In what amount will this title, The Politics of the Monstrous, be truncated while I, while I take down all the whales of writing and reading, always self-preferential, and until the academic writing becomes a special kind of monster itself, a bestiary of reading, archae of linearity, and hyperarchy of uh, new media reading turmoil. The text in front of you, or the text you are hearing now, will pursue monstrous lines of ramified rep repressions of discontinuities of history, culture, politics, and knowledge. Beneath those monstrous lines, or on their side, the void emerges, an abyss of the non-yet. Monsters must not be events of plain and snap respond, but of the absolute impossibility to respond in any known language. I have to justify my own eventuality by way of the monster, because only being with the monster, and only as a monster, I am an event. And fourth chapter of my book, The Politics of the Monstrous. The title is The Other Concerns Me, Heteronymous Experience. The notion of otherness is uh, crucial in 20th century social sciences and humanities, uh, in, especially within the frame of various disciplines, political theory, philosophy, ethics, psychoanalysis, anthropology, feminist theory, literary theory, media and communications theory, queer theory, creep theory, death studies, etc. Critical reading of the aspects of cultural fascination with the other different, unknown and foreign is based on recognition of techniques and modes of contemporary cultural environment and the cultural patterns related to the forms of marginalization and othering. Interdisciplinary approach and cross-scientific model of semiotics, sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, literary theory, feminist theories in recent science research examine the phenomenon of, of, of alterity in ethical, political, cult cultural and media domain, questioning the position of the other in discourses of culture, language, body, race, nation, gender, sex and colonial subject, and in the field of the new emergent monster theory. Rendered through West-East dichotomy, certain discursive issues of identity and difference, human and non-human, the phenomenon of race, nation, ethnic group, class, gender, are for formulated within a polarized paradigm of Western thought. Sue Golding, in her introduction to the eight technologies of otherness, has already called our attention to 
recasting and reproducing the very practices it and by it she means political enablement of empowerment necessity and change so that the very practices it is seeking to over overcome uh, the usual either or deep cut posturing non nonchalantly uh, take, uh, taking as given a binary divide and she continues open quote usually in the name of marginality excess and diversity but now more frequently still in the name of otherness itself we sadly annoyingly are often left with a kind of shopping list of so-called subjective other identities be it woman jew immigrant person of color dyke whore etc gathered together in opposition to the so-called objective dominant power forms of identities often named male white heterosexual middle or ruling class there is something not quite right with this picture end of quote the precursors to this either or deep cut are present in jean paul sartre's hell is other people ethical encounter with the other in works of emmanuel levinas Gilles Deleuze's intervention in Becoming and Subjectivation, and Jacques Derrida's re-questioning the concept of alterity radicalized in post-colonial and post-feminist theories. And these are just some of the most significant turns in thinking the difference and, ident and identity, and they are the inventive forms of redefining the philosophical scene. The question of alterity is precisely the cornerstone of reinterrogating the metaphysical schemes embedded in Western thought. The other is always and again inscribed in a founding platonic binarisms that are constantly rejuvenating themselves in contemporary thought, but also consistently being redefined and displaced in theoretical approaches in various fields. If the threshold of the 20th and 21st century philosophical inquiry are the linguistic term, the critique of organic representation, and the question of who or what is the subject, or who or what comes after the subject, then these three interrelated thresholds are the starting points to examine the authority of the non-European other. 20th century marks an era of an invention of the notion of otherness as a concept of impossibility detained at the border of what is signifiable, speak, speakable, and from this limit of the language one can only reproduce, strengthen, and maintain the practices of exclusion of the other. Or as Barth puts it, but language, the performance of a language system, is neither reactionary nor progressive, it is quite simply fascist, for fascism does not prevent speech, it compels speech. I have used parts of this text for my text on the Balkans. So if it if it's familiar, it's only because of that. So being the site of the construction of the other, language has always already missaid in Beckett's terms the other. To speak in the name of the other is to missay the other. As a cultural and political structure, language constructs the other, leaving the other only the quiescence, not the place to speak from. Hence, the other does not or is not able to speak because the other speaks within the language that made and unmade the other as such. And we are therefore destined to trace the sites of knowledge production of the other with the indignity that speaking in the name of the other carries. We are destined, and it must be liberating and agonizing, to stammer within the language structure, to distort the language structure with a stutter of alterity, to develop a non-style, a scripture intrinsic to the Western paradigm of thinking. The stammer is, in fact, a threatening, threatening voice, destabilizing the language of identity, or, as Deleuze states, a style is a managing to stammer in one's own language, not being a stammerer in one's speech, but being a stammerer of language itself, being like a foreigner in one's own language, constructing a line of light. We must be bilingual, inside our own language. We must create a minor use of our own language. And I will come back to this notion of style, specifically a proper style, cont contrary to the Lusian notion of style, uh, later uh, when dealing with the notion of palanka 
in the book by Radovir Konstantinovich. So let's go on. On the other hand, one cannot abide to mention the important works of Foucault, Agamben, Esposito, Haraway, Butler, Mbembe, Blanchot, Sixou, Nancy, and numerous others who have been dealing with the notion of otherness from diverse perspectives and precisely with the relation of otherness to the notion of the monstrous, developing fragmented or systemic approaches to the politics of the monstrous. I will elaborate on all of these approaches, but only as a delayed writing practice, as you all know, as a postscriptum. Consequently, thinking on otherness cannot be based solely on the foreknowledge of establishing any position of the subject within which the other is precisely politically and culturally co constitutive, but rather on an invention of a certain kind of post-knowledge on the stake of critical re-evaluation of the concept of knowledge as such. The question of otherness will erode the ground of metaphysical thought and precisely the notion of self-presence. The dichotomy that has encapsulated the notion of the other is platonic tradition that is always renewing, but also it is re-questioning on multiple fields of contemporary critical re-investigations of the concept, concept of alterity. Production of the discourse of the otherness is uh, actually a metonymic practice that is reducing the understanding of otherness to, this, to the ens essentialist needs of paradigmatic thinking. Objectification and reification practices within the knowledge production of the other are also producing the reality whose inevitable elements are precisely the figures of otherness. Places where the other resides uh, are not geographical, even though they are named and studied through discourse geography, which is representational. Western European political, economic and cultural projects maintain the system of representations of the other as the uncivilized, dangerous, bestial, in order to produce the system of asymmetrical relations of differentiation, subordination, inequality, exploitation, dependence, etc., with the aim to produce and reproduce the image of continual progress of Western civilization. The other is a product of reductive practices, as I have stated. However, the other cannot be reduced. The excess of the other bodies, always metonymically reduced to the same list of a type, of other narratives, myths, histories, desires and dreams, nightmarish quite often, is the disturbing force to reckon with. To think the other is to think spaces, and to think space is to think thinking. The other is not some entity occupying the space of pure culture. The other is the non-being at the limit. The border is not a fixed line, undisturbed and colonized, uncolonized by force, forceful representations. The border is mobile, it contains multiplicities, and its place is not only territorial but also historical, discursive. To investigate this limit, avoiding the trap of conceptualizing it for the mere purpose of delineation between the self and the other, we need to place ourselves at the brink of cultural, political and, ep and epistemological Western knowledge production. And this approach is complex and difficult because it needs to be constantly stitched through by the other, other voice, tonality and rhythm in order to reevaluate, deconstruct and destabilize Western cartography and representational discourse geography. Signifying practices are not innocent or neutral. Language is the originary site of colonization, a battlefield of meaning production. The shifts in Western thinking in 20th and 21st centuries are sliding over the limits of language as a place of invention of openness towards the call of the other. And this openness assumes theoretical stance of distancing oneself from the imperialism of the same toward the oniric Derrida's heterotautological dictum to think and welcome the gift of the unpredictable, uncanny and foreign. Every other is every bit other. In most of its parts, uh, this book will follow Levinas' ethics of responsibility, no one can answer in my place, as Levinas, Levinas notes, and especially his assertions that ethics precedes ontology, with Derrida's addition that ethics precedes and goes beyond the ethics itself. 
and that the ethical question begins with the epiphany of the face of the other. In that sense, the heteronymous experience, contrary to Kantian idea of autonomy of the subject, it would be an experience of the ab absolutely exterior, by which Levinas assumes a movement onto the other that is not recuperated in identification and does not return to its points of departure. Levinas is appealing to a particular radical thinking of openness and hospitality for the other that requires also radical generosity of the same who in the work goes onto the other and can only expect the ingratitude of the other. Open quote, the heteronymous experience we seek would be an attitude that cannot be converted into a cat category is it, not for, is it not furnished us uh, by what we call quite simple goodness and works without which goodness is but a dream without transcendence, a pure wish, blosser wunsch, as Kant put it. End of quote. Radical other, the monster, is reduced to the exteriority that is threatening and shocking to all that overcomes the acceptability of participating of the non-human, humanly unthinkable, unnatural, unsimilar within the imperialism of the one and the same human, natural and similar. The intimate cartographies of otherness are actually maps of vulnerability, the vulnerable bodies in relation to other bodies on these intimate limits are the sites of connections and risks, they are a relationship with the other who is reached without showing himself touched, as Levinas argues. But there is one line of thinking in Levinas, uh, the trace of the other, that has often been overseen. Namely, Levinas refers to a certain underlying allergy of philosophy, philosophy of being, immanence, autonomy, identity, and states the following, open quote, Western philosophy coincides with the disclosure of the other, where the other, in manifesting itself as a being, loses its alter alterity. From its infancy, philosophy has been struck with the horror of the other that remains other, with an insurmountable allergy. And I'll stop here. The only non-allergic re re relation would be ethical responsibility of heteronymous experience that never returns to the same. The allergy, the other effect that Levinas is writing about can be understood as an autoimmune practice that marginalizes the other and relieves the horror of the other revenant. Retracing Le Levinas' recognition of allergy at the core of philo philosophy of being, Derrida states that, open quote, for Levinas, on the contrary, allergy, the refusal or forgetting of the face, comes to inscribe its secondary negativity against the backdrop of peace, against the backdrop of a hospitality that does not belong to the order of the political, or at least not simply to a political space. The phenomena, phenomena of allergy, rejection, xenophobia, even war itself, would still exhibit everything that Levinas explicitly attributes to or allies with hospitality. So, whereas Levinas understands autoimmune reaction of the philosophy of being to the horror of the other, Derrida finds remarkable possibilities to welcome the other, to be open to something other the and more than itself, the other, the future, death, freedom, the coming or the love of the other, and all of the mentioned neurologic words that Derrida here catalogues are in, or in other Derrida's texts indexed as a monstrous potential of arrivant avenir of the to come. And this other effect, uh, the allergy of autoimmune response open to possibilities for responsibility which empties the eye of its imperialisms and its egoism, as Levinas points out, and it precisely means not to have time to time to turn back, to look away, or to respond volatile in defense. Allergic risk of being with the other, or the perilous condition to display skins in full bloom, are assumptions that uh, Ceres accentuates in the five senses of philosophy of mingled bodies, from 1985. 
in relation to the unthinkable yet ever-present existence of mixed bodies. Open quote, I am, I exist in this mixed contingency that changes again and again through the agency of the storm that is the other through the possibility of his or her existence. We throw each other off balance, we are at risk. The risk we are in, always exposed to the other, to mixing and coexistence cannot be eliminated within some knowledge of the other or on the other or any kind of, str kind of struggle that would end up in the purifying outcome of the I, the we, the community. This is the last chapter of the introductory part to my book. The title is Monstrous Relations, Heterogeneous Bliss. Uh, at the beginning of anthropology, the monster emerges hinged in conceptual structure. Anthropos is actually an endowment of Western metaphysics. Hinged dance of this miraculous non-species is representative also of my methodological approach. There is particular pathless method that can be understood as a xenogenetic text. If we trail Octavia Butler's literary works, especially Xenogenesis, it is an attempt to destabilize Genesis in identitarian sense as a deep cut that results in exclusions and binary machine. Becoming foreign, becoming other, perhaps even alterogenesis or even allogenesis is already inscribed in the, in the identity structure itself. The identity constitutes itself on the grounds of well-defined differentiation, all the while excluding the difference. As opposed to monological discourses that have constituted Western myths of origin and genesis, we can recognize certain slave narratives which Octavia Butler introduced in her trilogy Xenogenesis. In an essay, Dialogic Origins and Alien Identities in Butler's Xenogenesis, Katie Peppers differentiates between three dominant discourses on origin story in Western humanist grand narratives. The first discourse is, as expected, biblical narrative on Genesis. The second is related to sociobiological myths of placing our identity within the genes we carry. And the third discourse is represented by paleoanthropological myths of evolution from Neolithic ancestors. But the fourth discourse is a destabilizing one, although inscribed within the three dominant discourses. And this, this discourse assumes a certain slave narrative, subjugated knowledge in Foucault's terms, a xenogenerical resistance to traditional Western origin story. In Donna Haraway's words, uh, we have all been colonized by those origin myths with their longing for fulfillment in apocalypse. Biometographies are potential resistance sites to monstrumization of others or to that deep cut in binarisms which order our world and us within it. Audrey Lord coined the term biometo biometographies as an entry to a new genre especially when we are dealing with her biomythography Zami, the sister outsider, from 1982. Being a poet and radical feminist who occupy, occupies multiplying uh, minor positions, queer Afro-American woman, Audre Lorde's biomythography, which is in between biography and history of myth, is a transgressive genre or an illuminating form of moving beyond all the limitations, political, cultural, genre, a textual, gender, sexual, racial, etc. And if we are to remain loyal to Lord's assertion that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, the idea of biomythological dissipation of grand narratives of origin is a possible way to submerge currently available political tools into the processes of reallocation or reassignment 
or to invent completely different and new tools. Uh, as Haraway states, we need to focus powers on sur of survival, but only on the grounds of uh, seizing the tools to mark the world that has marked them as others. Outsider identities or the monstrous selves of feminist science fiction are an interesting uh, uh, starting point, here I go again with starting points, to interrogate effect, effects of uh, estrangement through inventions of biomythographical, cyborgian, Lilithian effects of subversion uh, of the traditional Western salvation history narrative. Slavoj Žižek has discussed the notion of the subject as a missing link in the casual chain as an effect of estrangement. Open quote, in its very being, the subject is constituted as a missing link of a casual chain. The chain in which no link is missing is the positivity of a substance without subject. Substance is subject means that there is always a link missing in the substantial chain. Therefore, uh, we can understand the missing link and xenogenetic subject from at least two perspectives. As a ruination of the normative aligned to the one and the same, and as a resistance is inscribed within the dominant discourse of sameness. To accept the foreign other as identity and to build the same identity by ways of excluding the foreign other is a particular humanist imaginary that inevitably rushes through every symbolic order of Western thinking and above all through political and ethical thinking. This humanist imaginary has been generated within the epic narratives of sumero Akkadian era when the primordial goddess of chaos was defeated by constituting the law and order of God creator. sumero Akkadian epic of creation Enuma Elish is a narrative of the origin of the world in order for order uh, to reassemble the chaos, it is necessary to conquer the monster of chaos by dismembering and reutilizing its body parts in creation of the territory of order. The world is created as a result of a battle between the god creator Marduk and the, the god of thunder and storm, that is, and the mother goddess of salt sea, Tiamat, the goddess of chaos. From the severed Tiamat's body, Marduk creates the world. The opening lines of this epic have been the subject of numerous interpretations and open quote. When on high the heaven had not been named, firm ground below had not been called by name, end of quote. The namelessness of heaven, that is sky, and ground, that is earth, is the origin of time and the beginning of the end of creation. From the womb of merged deities of Apsu and Tiamat, the world emerges, but names are absent. If naming is the practice of bringing to presence into becoming, that is equated with the notion of destiny in polytheistic belief systems of uh, ancient Near East. To pronounce a name is the site of power to assign destiny to govern and pro uh, the processes of becoming. The originary chaos of merged waters, sea, so, salt sea of Tiamat and fresh water of Apsu, uh, in epic, uh, in this narrative, the, the line is their waters commingling as a single body. So this originary chaos of merged waters is nameless. It is not the place of destiny, but of coincidence. Narrative of creation will be initiated by releasing four winds onto the Tiamat's waters, even though Tiamat has brought the world to life, the same world that will dismember her body. And, and that is the moment when the battle of assigning names begins. Tiamat, the goddess of darkness and chaos, she who bore them all, gives birth to the monstrous offspring that, world, that would, I'm sorry, that would as a special kind of army on, of monsters confront Marduk, the deity of light and order, represented as sun hero, as solar deity. The epic narrative Enuma Elish is one of the formative origin stories, introducing the difference between good and evil. 
On this plane of metapoetical polarization, we can witness the renewal and maintaining of the fixed representation of gendered monster within the Babylonian pantheon. Marduk, the Cosmocrator, armed with invisib invisible light and winds, attacks Tiamat's fluid body. Into her mouth, he releases the wind and her body falls apart. Open quote. The Lord spread out his net to enfold her. He let loose in her face the evil wind which followed behind. When Tiamat opened her mouth to consume him, he drove in the evil wind and she could not doze her lips. As the fierce winds encumbered her belly, her body was this destined and her, and her mouth was wide open. He released an arrow, it tore her belly, it cut through her inside, splitting her heart. Having subdued her, he blotted out her life, he threw down her carcass and stood upon it." End of quote. From the oceanic motherly body of the goddess Tiamat, Marduk creates the world and he gives name to every created structure. As uh, uh, Gregory Mobley argues, open quote, through Tiamat, it, though Tiamat is slain, her body parts are reutilized to create the world. The recycling of Tiamat's carcass, the creation of cosmic and terrestrial structures out of her limbs and organs, suggests that chaos lies at the foundation of creation, that everything fixed might yet sway, end of quote. Chaos lies within the basis of every political, cosmic and every order whatsoever, but it is also the force that threatens those orders, as Timothy Bell claims. Monsters, as Tiamat is named in Babylonian epic, as a monstrous horde, are dislocated at the limits of the known, of knowledge and the human, at the very verge of order, as that which demonstrates itself as the radical otherness, as an alterity that guarantees the uh, sustainability of the order. The discourse of or on man is bordered and threatened by tan tangential approach and departure of the syncopated pace of monster. Monsters are already distant by way of constantly approaching and closing in. Hence, Marduk's guards will be on constant watch for Tiamat's approaching waters, making sure that she is always away, far removed and always distant. May the winds bear her blood to, pieces, to places undisclosed. The monster is always and only tan ta tangential, never assimilated, never completely excluded. Open quote. Notice, moreover, that the one who defeats the chaos monster in this story is also the one who most resembles her. Like Tiamat, Marduk is associated with images of cosmic turbulence. He uses a flood wave, flood wave to stir up Tiamat. He wields an unfaceable flood weapon, a tempest, a tornado, and a whirlwind. In fact, Marduk's own depiction is monstrously and evesomely unnatural, defying the imagination. His limbs are said to be beyond comprehension, impossible to understand, too difficult to perceive. He was four eyes, he has four eyes and four ears, and fire blazes forth from his mouth whenever he moves his lips. Perhaps it takes a chaos monster to kill a chaos monster. End of quote. The communal body, worldly body, is never pure and self-same. There is always that touch of chaos, and the aesthetics of the monstrous is evident in horrific touch that touches without touching. Will Tiamat's fluid body ever, gain touch, ever again touch the shores of the Marduk's world of order? In accordance, the monster cannot be approached as some isolated phenomenon guarded by insummon insummonable borders. The monster is always a relation and as such indicates the work of the limit itself between exclusive categories. Outside of that relation, monster is yet easily recognizable figure of popular culture domesticated in constant saturation of mass media imaginary. 
Margaret Sheldrick notes that we are always and everywhere vulnerable precisely because the monstrous is not only an exteriority. As much as Tiamat's body is vulnerable to the stormy winds of the supreme solar deity, her body, dismembered and transformed into territories, cosmic, celestial and terrestrial, so her body would actually always return as a revenant and from the body of Mother Goddess she would become a dangerous multiplying fragment that floods, irrigates and withdraws Marduk's woundable shores, whether cosmic, celestial and terrestrial. The monster and that which is supposed to be outside or the outside as such intrudes upon the order, the imagined inside. Consequently, Tiamat is not subdued, erased or defeated, and she does not belong only to the space on the other side, to outsideness. As a trace, she resides within the determinate structure of light and order, a trace of chaos onto which the order is built. Either or categories of Western logic, based seemingly on firm funda foundations of order, are shaking, and precisely within this deep cut, the questions are screaming to be asked. It is not that some bodies are reducible to the same while others uh, figure as the absolute other, but rather that all resist full, full or final expression. The security of categories, whether the self or non-self, is undone by radical undesirability. Perhaps we cannot avoid categorization, but we can always be cautious of the construction of categories, of all the abyssal exclusive relations that depict logical, ontological, epistemological, political and ethical violence. As Schildrich reminds us, to valorize the monster then is to challenge the parameters of the subject as defined within the logocentric discourse. Monsters are the liminal beings the tissue of the limited self, epidermis of the human space, neither outside nor inside, constantly on the move and being far removed and distant forever as Tiamat. They cannot be locked down and attached to the term monster because they dismantle their own nominal status in the axiomatics of medicine, biology, biotechnology, anthropology, biopolitics and necropolitics. In that sense, the monster is the skin without a body, a skin drawn over the tissue of the real, over the given flesh, bios and zoe, over life and over living, over death and decay. The touch of monster is the touch of the non-sensorial, of chaos that devastates the senses but grants the possibility to invent a new sensorium. Monstrous touch wrecks the senses without touching them. Monsters actually do not touch. They don't belong to the haptic phenomenon of contact in haptocentric context. They don't touch as a totality of parts, because monsters are made in endless metonymic displacements. The skin of community is actually a cutting edge, a blade sharpened by hygienic practices of formal logic. On the tip of that blade, the monster slides. Its touch is unbearable, and so is the touch of the communal skin. The horror is present, not only on the limit of exoderm. Endoderm is the actual space of danger. Monsters appear as terrifying fragments, even though they are constantly decapitated, mutilated, severed, wounded. Monsters always survive life and death by adding always another part. They have a tendency, tendency to reawaken, reassemble their, 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 sorry, their dismembered parts and return for a sequel. Therefore, it is, it's not uh, that important to state that monster evades death, the ultimate desire, the fixed and predefined human desire. The crucial insight that monster provides is that one has to survive life. In order to approach fluidity of monster, uh, it is necessary to departure from the notion of human, of the human. We need to access anthropogenesis only to notice the codes of teratogenesis. We can freely say that the transsensorium of the new millennia placed between organic and machinic is transgenic, and that is our heterogeneous bliss. 
Deconstructionist parasitism is my analytical approach. Perhaps the other does not exist, but to state something like that would mean the capitulation of the monster other and ignorant celebration of the reductive notion of humanist subject. The upbringing of human, its building, is grounded on political codification of normality. The standard of normality has been defined according to non-standard, non-normal. What we are dealing with is always already a negative affirmation. Monsters have been de depicted in some form of excess or a lack. They have been the signs of unnatural and quite, of quite, often, quite often to supernatural. In a way, the natural is equivalent to normal, and the axiomatics of this equation has, in the course of particular, particular legitimation, pra legitimation practices, lost, it, lost its, its volatile imagery and became natural, became a norm. Is it possible to depart from the vicious logical circle? Is there any paralogical place from which it is possible to talk and to dance with monsters? Can we think not about monsters, but with monsters, or with the human? Does such path of pataphysical place even exist? The other is not an entity that occupies the space of pure culture. Being a monster, a body, or a monster space, the other is liminal. The limit is monster space as such, and following Nancy's dictum, we can also state that a thought of a limit is a thought of excess. Open quote. Such a thought will have to be articulated and not in terms of schemes and or of transcendence or transgression, but in terms of beyond scheme of the passage to the limit, in which the two combines the values of on the edge, beyond, across and along, the values of touching and detachment, of penetration and escape, transitive and intransitive at once. End of quote. And to conclude, uh, can we think about culture as the space of excesses and as multiplying? Can we, and there is always a possibility, can we imagine the culture as the plurality of mixed culture, as Nancy states in his eulogy of mixing, in which every space is both other and inclusive at the same time? Uh, the question remains, is it possible to think the culture as an open space of excesses and as a multitude? Is it possible because there is always a choice uh, to imagine a culture as a plurality of mixed culture in which, and outside of it, every space is always already space of the other and inclusive? I, I have repeated myself. Uh, and this research will be situated on the sites of limits, on the margins of the thinkable and conceptual, hence the path towards the otherness of monstrous figures, spaces and bodies will persistently be crossed with another voice, movement, touch and detachment, and this writing will undergo infinite dissolution, detotalization and dissignification. It is my aim to access the other by circumventing and re-evaluating academic positivist paradig paradigm and to offer as a certain patchwork poetics, the critical and constructivist method. This method will enable me to, while avoiding the exhibition of knowledge, to problematize the sole possibility of knowledge archive and the dictum to speak from the position of the one who possesses the knowledge. Consequently, the language that is the agency of stitching in this research will not be hidden behind codified rational conclusions, but will be protrude into the foreground as an unavoidable re-questioning of the notion of language itself that presumes signifying practices abiding the principles of logic.